So in today's video, we're going to take a look at uh, balance sheets. Now, in a previous video, we've looked at what is profit. And a lot of investors look at profit and loss accounts. And as long as profit's rising, they think, great, this is a company I want to buy. But actually, that can be a mistake. You need to look at the balance sheet as well. Uh, it's not the most exciting document to read. It's got a lot of numbers and a lot of jargon in it. But without a balance sheet, you can't really get a sense for what a business is maybe worth and what its therefore sort of long-term prospects are. So this video is all about what balance sheets are for and the very basic types of information you can expect to take away without getting buried in the jargon and the accounting buzzwords. OK, so where do they fit in? Uh, well, accounts basically can be divided into three important statements. Buried right in the middle of the 100-page document we call a set of accounts, you'll find a profit and loss account, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement. So let's take a look at those first two. In, a, in essence, what you've got is this. Every 12 months, the directors will prepare a balance sheet. As such, it represents you freezing the business and taking almost a photograph of where it's at right now. And you'll notice the balance sheets are prepared at specific dates. So, for example, you might have a balance sheet prepared at the 31st of December for a particular year, say 2010. Another popular one is the end of the tax year for companies, so quite often you'll find 31st of March 2011, let's say. The point is the directors pick a point in time, um, the end of the trading year if you're a retailer, for example, sort of around Christmas time, let's say, or the end of the tax year, they're quite popular but certainly not the only options, and you prepare a snapshot. See balance sheets very much as taking a photograph at one point in time. Now as such, it's a slightly artificial exercise. Balance sheets are out of date almost as soon as they're prepared, because of course in reality businesses don't just stop, they keep going. But nonetheless, as a quick snapshot of what a business might be worth, balance sheets can be quite useful. And usually they're prepared at 12 month gaps uh, to keep the accountants happy with possibly an interim statement somewhere in between, say every six months or even every three months. Now, just worth noting that although we're going to focus on balance sheets, if this is a 12-month period, um, a profit and loss account is more of a story. It tells the tale of how the business got from here to there. And hopefully the answer is by making profits. In other words, the business grew. So, although this video isn't about profit and loss accounts, see the profit and loss account as more like a cine camera, capturing everything that's happened and summarising it between two balance sheet dates, then the balance sheet is a photograph. So the language of profit and loss accounts is sales, revenues, minus costs, to give you a profit. It's a story. Sales will have been made January, February, March, April, May, and so on. Costs will have been incurred, and they're just summarised for each 12-month period. But really, for a sense of what the business might be worth to an accountant, let's say, you want the balance sheet, the snapshot. So, what is a balance sheet? What makes it different to this thing, the profit and loss account? OK, well, basically, balance sheets are simply quick snapshot statements of net worth. So, sounds very flash, actually very simple. As Tim Bennett, I could draw up a personal balance sheet. I could start to list right now what my assets are, what I own, um, so a property, some cash in my pocket, uh, and so on. Um, then I've got some, some things I owe other people. So my net worth isn't my property because I'm forgetting there's a mortgage on it. So actually, if I sold my property tomorrow, all the cash isn't mine. I'm not going to sell it tomorrow, but if I did, um, I'd have to pay back a mortgage first. So actually the net bit I own is a bit smaller. Um, and then perhaps I remember that I owe my mate 20 quid from last week down the pub. So I've got to think about repaying him at some point. That's called a liability, an amount that I've got to pay back at some point, even if I don't do it now. Um, so I could start to think about my personal net worth in terms of the assets I own, and some of them will be long term and short term, and the amounts that I owe other people. 
some of those are short term and long term. My mate's debt, I'll, I'll pay him back next week. That'll be gone in a week. But my mortgage, that's not going to be gone for 20 years. So some of my liabilities are short and long term too. And my net worth is presumably the difference. Um, and that'll increase or decrease depending on which day of the week you ask me to do it. Um, and that's roughly what companies do. A balance sheet is simply a statement, if you like, of what they own minus what they owe other people at, let's say, the 31st of March. The difference is known, not surprisingly, as the net position. And then at the bottom, the reason they balance is you answer the question, how has that net position been funded? Balance sheets balance because those two numbers should be the same. In other words, you can't conjure net worth out of thin air. It'd be nice if you could, but no one I've yet met can do it. Um, in other words, somebody has funded that net position. So maybe I started my whole personal balance sheet as Tim Bennett. Um, how did I ever go to a bank to afford a property? Perhaps my father gave me some money to get me going. Um, and with that, I put the deposit down on the property. That allowed me to borrow, and so on. Now, companies don't have friendly dads who give them money. Well, some do. Um, but normally, they have shareholders. So how's the whole thing been paid for is normally called shareholders' funds. And the balance sheet balances because the company's net worth is equivalent to what shareholders have put in, plus any profits the company has made since it started. So, taking this a step further, companies use jargon at this point to explain what they own, but the jargon shouldn't put you off. So, for example, they'll break their assets into fixed, slightly confusing term, and current. In other words, just like I did with my personal balance sheet back there, uh, companies own some things long term. Fixed doesn't mean nailed to the floor. It means stuff we're going to keep for more than a year from the balance sheet date. So it includes land and buildings, plant machinery, vehicles, that kind of stuff. Current assets, short term assets, the stuff that if you did this exercise in a year's time, it's probably all going to be gone, or at least have changed. So cash, stock, stock in the sense of uh, the stuff the company makes, for example, raw materials, components lying around if it's a car manufacturer, for example, um, and also receivables. Um, so, for example, if you lend someone £100 down the pub and you were to draw up a personal balance sheet, that'd be a little bit of a sad thing to do, um, they owe you the money in your books. This would be the sad bit. That would be a receivable. And if you didn't think you'd receive it all, you'd write some of it off. Uh, Anyway, so companies have things called receivables as well within current assets. So these are the sort of accounting headings that you start to see. And also, companies like to break what they owe to external creditors, so banks, for example, and other lenders, into short-term um, amounts due in less than one year, and long-term amounts where, realistically, we'll be paying it off in more than one year. So for me, you know, an amount, an overdraft, for example, is a short-term creditor. It's an expensive way to fund a business long-term. It's an expensive way to fund Tim Bennett long-term. But a personal loan for me, or a, a 10-year loan for a company, that falls into creditors due in more than one year. And that's just a bit of jargon. Um, debtors or receivables are current assets. That's people who owe us money. Creditors, amounts that we owe other people. Um, but nonetheless, even if you break it down into four numbers, those are positive because they're assets. Those are negative because they're liabilities. You still end up with a, hopefully, net asset position. Now, down here, funding, as it's called, breaks down, broadly speaking, into share capital and profits. In essence, what we're saying is, in the past, in order to build the business, the company's probably sold shares to external shareholders. That funding is represented here as share capital. And also, over time, hopefully, the company's been trading profitably. Every 12 months, that profit statement is positive. And if you run a profit 
a positive profit statement for, say, 10 years since you started a business, you'll have 10 years of accumulated profits, assuming you haven't paid out dividends, and all of that ultimately belongs to the shareholders of the business. So the shareholders' contribution sits at the bottom of the balance sheet, and this is a simplification, but it's split, broadly speaking, into amounts the shareholders have put in to fund the business, and the accumulated profits that if the business was liquidated tomorrow, so the theory goes, <coughs> they would receive. Now, just going to finish with the reason balance sheets balance. Just to give you a flavour for that, um, they always balance, and that's because accountants have a habit of recording everything twice, which forces them to balance. So what that means is when you look at the balance sheet, that number is the same as that number, or that number is the same as that number. Um, and the reason is, is simply this. If, for example, I were to borrow £100, as an accountant, I would raise my current assets by 100 cash, and I'd also raise my current liabilities by 100 because I've got to pay it back at some point. Net effect, zero. Or if I ask my shareholders for some more cash, Share capital rises to reflect their contribution by, say, 100. And cash up here rises by 100. That's up 100, that's up 100, the whole thing balances. So this isn't a bookkeeping course, but because accountants record everything twice, balance sheets always balance. That doesn't matter too much. What's more important is to realise that the top half represents net ownership of assets at a snapshot point in time, and the bottom half represents how that's all been paid for. Now, as an investor, what are the takeaways from this? Number one, don't just look at profit and loss accounts. That's dangerous because a company may make uh, one-off profits one year, but, but what about the longer-term picture? For that, you need a balance sheet. The balance sheet is also the place where you'll find hidden nasties that are simply not in the profit and loss account. For example, there's a note that supports the balance sheet called contingent liabilities. It's written, and it's quite a long way after the balance sheet, and that reveals liabilities, nasties, so it's, it's, it's in this little section here, that the company hasn't yet recorded on the balance sheet but might become a problem in the future. Lawsuits, for example, outstanding at the balance sheet date. And also, if you're looking for what's the business worth, whilst a balance sheet isn't fantastic because it's out of date and it's prepared according to accounting rules, so assets are often recorded at their historic cost, not always at their current market value, it's a good starting point. A profit and loss account will not tell you what a company's worth. It just tells you what one year's profitability looks like. But a balance sheet is at least a starting point for getting a, a handle on, essentially, the value of the entire business.